Dick Keller racks up another win in DC, plus an interview with NSSF's Larry Keene on the industry's reaction to new credit card codes for gun retailers. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I made the devil run. I gave him poison just for fun. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also the founder of TheReload.com, where you can head over and sign up for our free newsletter right now if you want to get uh, weekly updates on the most important pieces of gun news in the country. Uh, we don't flood your mailbox with with emails. We just send one a week. Uh, if there's breaking news, we'll send uh, an email as well, but that's uh, we don't treat breaking news the way some other outlets do. It's uh, actual breaking news whenever we send you something very important things. It's not a, a, a very common thing. That's the whole uh, you know idea of breaking news. But anyway, um, you can head over there and check check out those options today. As well as uh, if you want to support the reporting that we're doing, we are wholly member funded. So you can join today and be one of those members who will get exclusive access to hundreds of analysis pieces and news stories that you can't read anywhere else, uh, as well as early access to this podcast and the opportunity to appear on the show as well. So uh, this week, we're going to be talking a bit about the industry. And who better to talk about the industry, the gun industry, than the uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation. And uh, Larry Keene is uh, executive vice president there, and he is joining the show today. How are you doing, Larry? Very good. Uh, thanks for having us. And I want to say my inbox thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Larry. Uh, Larry is on the email, so he knows that we don't we don't flood the inboxes uh, of everyone who subscribes. But uh, can you tell people just a little bit more about the National Shooting Sports Foundation? Because I'm sure uh, not everyone might know what you are. Uh, NSSF is the Firearms Industry Trade Association. So our members are you know, all of the major firearms and ammunition manufacturers, uh, distributors, and retailers from you know the big boxes, uh, Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's and such, all the way down to the independent uh, mom and pop uh, gun store uh, in, in rural America. And we have, you know, people make all sorts of products for hunting, shooting sports, and personal protection, optics, and as we like to say, anything you can put in, on, around, or through a firearm. So um, people may know uh, the SHOT Show. So NSSF uh, owns the SHOT Show. We produce that every year. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're uh, the industry trade Association. Yes, that's the big show in Vegas, which I, I'm lucky enough to cover every year and uh, where you have tens of thousands of people from specifically the gun industry, who who show up. Uh, and so you guys obviously have a lot of knowledge about what happens in, in the industry, and you are advocates for the industry. You are uh, the actual gun lobby. Uh, yeah. in this, uh, yes, we as are much the actual as, gun lobby, yeah. Yes, as much as uh, people have called the NRA that for a long time, they're a different organization with uh, different membership that's that has different goals. Yeah. You guys yeah. are the ones who actually advocate for the industry itself. Yeah, we don't have individual members. Our, our members are, are businesses, uh, and we are the actual, literal corporate gun lobby. But uh, yes, so yeah, yes, I've always that's one of the things that's always I've always been a bit uh, bemused by in in uh, the common discourse in media when people talk talk about the NRA as the gun lobby and just sort of ignore that there actually is a literal one that operates on behalf of the the industry. And uh, until recently, you know, in recent years, you guys have been getting a lot more heat on that front. Well, actually. I was just going to say, um, <laughs> you know, uh, we've become a target uh, like never before by groups, particularly Giffords, for example, and, mm -hmm. and others, uh, you know, attacking NSSF, um, you know, lying about positions that we have taken on on issues, but um, or just being to be charitable, badly informed or misinformed, if not outright lies to advance their political agenda and raise money. But so, you know, we, we've uh, sort of been discovered, if you will. <laughs> yes, certainly becoming much uh, higher profile. Uh, not, I don't know that that's <laughs> what your goal has been. But uh, this week, uh, obviously, we've been talking a lot about uh, an, is an issue that directly impacts the industry 
which is this uh, adoption of a new merchant category code among the major credit card issuers. Visa, MasterCard, and American Express have all said they're going to adopt this new code for gun retailers. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of concern over this. There's been a lot of uh, pushback from NSSF and other uh, gun rights advocacy groups, including the NRA uh, and, and GOA and, and others. But uh, we wanted to have you on to see sort of uh, a bit more of an, a deeper insight into what this is going to do, uh, what you guys are concerned about with this change, and uh, you know how it might affect, uh, in your minds, these retailers that you represent. So can you just give us a basic rundown of that? It, it's uh, get a little involved. It's kind of wonky, uh, uh, but the bottom line is that Andrew Ross Sorkin, who's a business writer, New York Times, also uh, on CNBC, very anti-gun, came up with this idea after Parkland 2018, and he's been advocating and writing about it. Um, and the proposal has gone before this international standard setting organization called uh, ISO, in the past and been rejected by the committee within ISO that works on these uh, payment processing standards. Um, and, and ISO is a massive organization. They, they write standards for thousands and thousands of industries, uh, not just payment processing. But uh, it was been rejected twice. Um, and then we understand from discussions with the credit card processors and others, that um, ISO asked Am Amalgamated Bank, which was sort of the sponsor of this proposal, to resubmit, even though it had been rejected tw at least twice. And by way of background, Amalgamated Bank is, um, uh, you know, they, they call themselves a socially responsible bank. They're a quote unquote woke bank. They're also very closely aligned with the Democrat Party. They are the bank of the DNC. They're Nancy Pelosi's bank. They do provide the banking services for Democrat campaigns um, all across the country. And uh, as, as Amalgamated may suggest, its origins are, you know, arise out of uh, the, the unions. And the CEO is very anti-gun. And so they presented this proposal to require gun stores to have this specific merchant category code, or MCC. Um, and so on September 7th, it went before ISO again. And apparently at the committee level that dealt with it, it was again rejected, but um, it was appealed that same day, which is very surprising and troubling, uh, raises a lot of questions. It was appealed within ISO and then approved at a higher level within ISO. We still don't know exactly uh, what took place in Geneva, Switzerland, which is where ISO is based. We know that there are members on the Hill that want answers to these questions, and they've started asking those questions of the credit card processors um, already. And there have been meetings just uh, within the last 24 hours on the Hill uh, with some of these companies and members of Congress. Uh, that yeah, and I, I believe there's been a letter that was sent by a hundred Republican yep. congressmen to Visa so, right. to outline a number of questions. Right, so there been a quite aware. a number. There was a large letter, a hundred plus members in the House that was sent to the three credit card processors. There have been two Senate letters, I believe, that have gone already, uh, and there will be more for sure. But uh, so ISO approved this standard and created or will create a. Uh, merchant category code for gun stores. Now, others that sell guns are not would not be captured by that code. So, for example, Walmart, because it sells so many different things, has a, a, as a category as a mass merchant, uh, and I don't know what the number is, but they have their own code, uh, and it kind of ref the code is supposed to reflect what your primary business is, and then sporting goods stores like uh, an Academy, for example. Uh, or, or, or Cabela's or Bass Pro Shop, something like that, would have a sporting goods category that's different, even though they sell guns and ammunition. So now gun stores, which had been captured in a miscellaneous code, 
as a specialty retailer will now have a standalone code. So the concern is that once that code is implemented and the, the three credit card processors have said they will implement the code, the standard, because that's the standard, uh, but they, you know, they've been very quick to say they don't want this, uh, that they were, it, it had been opposed. I don't know if they remained opposed. Sure. There's some well, questions there, but so yeah, let's, let's we'll get into happens, that. Right. Like, yeah. Well, well, one, I want to just start real quick sure. with uh, with Sorkin. You brought him up earlier yes. uh, and we'll get into what the credit card companies are saying in a moment here. But uh, Sorkin uh, sort of came was the driving force, I would say, behind this concept of using MCC codes uh, or creating a special MCC code for gun retailers. You know, back in 2018, he did a whole story. Uh, he did stories about how, uh, you know, some of the mass shooters had used um, credit cards to finance some of their gun purchases, uh, and that you know this was uh, a way. In, in his explaining of it, uh, the desire seems to be to try and track patterns of gun purchasing that would could indicate somebody is um, about to commit a mass shooting. That seems that's you know if you read his pieces. And by the way, we invited him on the show. Uh, reached out to the New York Times to see if he'd come on, and he. Uh, declined to do that. Unfortunately, I'd still be happy to talk to him because I'm very interested in the sort of the, as we'll get into the logic behind a lot of this, this stuff and how this plan is supposed to work. But, um, you know, the, the concept here is supposed to be that you can identify some kind of pattern in gun purchasing that would create a, you know, a red flag similar to how the banks um, report potential fraud. Uh, in in the financial system to law enforcement. And so that was the idea behind creating this MCC code. Now, um, I guess the first question there is um, how, so MCC codes, to your understanding, um, they don't allow people, they don't allow the banks or credit card companies to see individual items purchased, just that Correct. the person was shopping at a particular Right. kind of store, right? That's exactly right. All the code tells someone in the payment processing system is the type of store uh, where the transaction is taking place. Nobody can see inside the basket at, at checkout counter, right? So they don't know if you're spending $2,000 on duck decoys, $2,000 on guns, $2,000 on ammunition. They have no idea what you're buying. Uh, and the credit card processes have been very clear. They don't know. They don't want to know. They don't really care because, the, you know, that's not their job. Um, you know, if it's a legal transaction, you know, they'll process it. And so it doesn't it doesn't really tell um, amalgamated or, you know, it doesn't do what Andrew Ross Sorkin thinks it does. But that's the concern. And in fact, after... He passed. He had another piece in the New York Times, you know, championing what ISO had done, and then said, "Now we got to go do the next steps, which is that an amalgamated is working on this to develop an algorithm to identify what are what they would consider to be suspicious transactions. Right. If you don't know what somebody's buying, how in the world do you know whether it's suspicious or not?" Um, yeah, so that seems to be a big a big um, flaw in this a, a huge, this idea. Huge. So how that, do you so how do you solve that? What comes next is pressure to allow the banks um, to see what's inside the basket. So you have an invasion of privacy, uh, and then well, you're buying one of those guns. No, 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 that's suspicious. Or no, we're just not going to process that transaction. Or you're buying too much ammunition, or you're buying too many guns, or w whatever the case will be that they decide is suspicious, and so then they will file suspicious activity reports with the Treasury Department, um, and that opens up a can of worms. What does Treasury do with that? Well, maybe they put you on terrorist watch list. Maybe they put you on the no-fly list. You have no idea. You have no way of getting off of that list. Or it's given to, to law enforcement or ATF, and then all of a sudden law enforcement shows up at your door and says, let's see what you purchased, even though you've right. done nothing wrong, even though you're exercising a constitutional right. So you, know, you have privacy issues, 
you know, wrapped around the exercise of a, a fundamental constitutional right. It's very, very troubling. Um, and sure, you, you know, this push will not just stop at, okay, now we have a code. They want to see what you're buying so they can stop you from buying it. Yeah, certainly. I think even going back to those 2018 stories, uh, you know, he, he's talking about these purchases that are made across multiple different accounts at multiple different retailers and are for not just firearms, especially in the case, I believe, of uh, the Parkland shooter. You know, he's, he lists in there things like, um, you know, targets or magazines that he bought as being this overall amount of money that he spent on uh, guns and, uh, you know, number of transactions over two months. And, you know, when I look at these uh, examples, I don't know that I see much of a pattern that isn't that's distinct from just normal gun buying by a normal person that millions of people do every year. I guess that's the core of this. Do you uh, see uh, any legitimacy in this idea that you could identify some sort of predictive pattern in in gun purchasing that would help you catch a mass shooter or perhaps a you know a gun trafficker that has been the other? Uh, you know, I I uh, don't examples. believe that you can or that it would be effective. You know, one, keep in mind retailers. You know, who are making the sale, if they think something is suspicious, they can, as they do all the time, deny the sale and contact ATF or local law enforcement. That happens every day in this country, right? So the retailer is in a better position to make a judgment on that than some algorithm or somebody sitting at a computer terminal in some center in India or something going to decide whether it's suspicious or not. I don't know how you would decide that, particularly when you don't know what the, even the person's purchasing. Or if somebody goes goes shooting every weekend, they buy ammunition every weekend. That's very suspicious. I mean, it's just fraught with uh, opportunities for abuse. Um, and you know, the credit card processors, particularly since ISO has adopted this, have, have sent letters um, to Senator Warren and others that have supported this to say, you know, we will adopt the code because that's the standard. But this changes nothing. We don't see inside the basket. We don't want to see inside the basket. It's not our job. Now, also, credit card companies, banks already have a legal obligation to report to Treasury to file a suspicious activity report if they see any activity that is suspicious. But this is in the context of fraud, like, you know, Stevens credit card, uh, you know, is always used in a certain geographic reason because that's where he lives. And all of a sudden, there's a transaction with this card in India. Well, that gives you something to say, wait a second, what's going on here? He's, Stephen never goes to India. you know. And, and that happens with people. If you're traveling, you might get a call from your credit card company saying, is this you? And that sort of thing. But just to look at purchases, a dollar amount, and say, well, this person bought something from a gun store. They, there must be something nefarious here. It, it's going to result. In, in, and then what's going to happen? Law enforcement is going to get inundated with these with these suspicious activity reports, what are they going to do? Start knocking on your door or just ignore it? It, it does, I don't see how it works. I don't think they truly understand how the process actually works. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, it does strike me as something of an idea that, uh, yeah. something of a New York Times idea, if that it, makes any it's sense. Happening. Like and something, you, yeah. so what do you see something happening? where they just don't have an understanding no. of how people actually buy guns in real life. It, and so they see. Yeah. Uh, well, this mass shooter bought, um, you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of guns in two months. And that's shocking to them because they have this, they don't understand that a lot of people buy a couple thousand dollars worth of guns in uh, in every couple of months. Like, it's not an uncommon thing yeah. to do. It's sort of this um, uh, classic media uh, yep. misunderstanding when they're describing uh, arsenals, right? And yep. it's a couple hundred rounds of ammunition yeah. and, a, and like five guns. Yeah. That's that is not an uncommon well, thing for yeah, just normal exactly. people to have. And I will country. tell you, in, in having conversations with the credit card processes, several of them have, have indicated to us that they don't believe that uh, Andrew or Sorkin or the politicians advocating for this understand how the system works uh, and that you know this is not going to do what they think unless it goes to these next steps where they can right. see inside the basket. And, or start denying transactions, and and the pressure will be applied to the issuing banks um, to start denying transactions. Yeah, that was the other, uh, I guess, suggestion that Sorkin had in one of his 
uh, pieces that you could use MCC codes. You know, I, I think for, you know, Americans outside of like the, the jargon of the financial industry, what, you know, the most common use of an MCC code is on things like rewards credit cards, right? When you buy, uh, you know, you know, gas you know, on your special credit card or a flight, you get money back for that. Well, that, that's the result of MCC codes, I believe, is how that yeah. works. And so, so that gives people like an, that, a context for what, what these well, actually do. So the other thing, Sorkin's more recent piece said, OK, now mass, you know, uh, sporting goods stores that also sell guns, they have to have a separate right. counter and they have to apply the code to transactions at that counter. And they analogize to like you go to CVS and you got to pay for your prescription jugs at, at the pharmacy counter. But you can also buy anything else you want to buy in the store. You can you can ring up at that cash register. So that right. doesn't tell you anything. Yeah, that was the other, I think significant shortcoming of this concept, even if you d did believe that you could identify some sort of suspicious buying, buying pattern uh, with an MCC code at gun retailers, if it's not applied to Cabela's and you know, Bass Pro and these bigger stores where a lot of guns are sold, like, you know, right. certainly um, Smith & Wesson's uh, earnings numbers, which which actually we'll get into a little bit later for a, a separate story, but uh, they indicate that they sell, I think, a majority of their uh, guns through large retailers. And so if you're not capturing those, you, like it wouldn't yeah. Yeah. You know, trip and up this whole concept to begin with. Walmart's right? the largest firearms dealer in the country, right? Collectively, all their stores combined. So, Still, really? you know, how are you going to do this? You, you won't know. And so now, you, so again, not, you have to see inside the basket, right? Which is what they want. Yeah. And then they're going to say, I, you can't do a transaction with somebody buying a modern sporting rifle or right. a magazine of that size or that much ammunition. Right. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is part of a larger fight uh, mm -hmm. to try and restrict access to financial or to financing by yes. uh, gun mm -hmm. companies. And, and now it's moved on to gun buyers in this instance, yeah. uh, whereas before it was like banks refusing to work with Smith & Wesson or Ruger or other gun companies if they didn't right. stop making certain uh, guns like the AR-15. Right. Uh, before that, it was Operation Choke Point, which involved mm -hmm. banking for, uh, you know, members of the industry right. which and members of other disfavored industries like payday loans. But right. but now now this is moving on to the to sort yeah. of average Americans, people who buy guns now would, yep. in theory, uh, if they... Now, obviously, again, this is... We're at the first step on this path that they want to go down, and certainly seems like the credit card processors are not interested in going any further than this. But, but um, you know, the end goal would be, the end result would be, you know, tracking of everyone who buys guns in America. For, right. So you could have a, a a registry of gun owners maintained by private corporations. Yeah. And so let me get your reaction to it's the same way a government database would be concerning. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's if you got all the way down the line of these changes they want, uh, which have not happened, to be very clear, right. they got the MCC changes, what has happened, they would need a lot more, uh, you know, the transaction level vis visibility than reporting to police and law enforcement and the government. You know, there's, there's a lot more that have to happen to get to that point. But it does seem to be the ultimate endpoint. If you read Sorkin's work, like, yep. that's, that's what they want. They want uh, surveillance of all gun sales in the United States so they can sort of pre-crime track it to try and flag uh, potentially suspicious purchases. But uh, let me get uh, Visa's quote here. They, they published a blog um, and they said, uh, quote, and this is, this is in line with things they've said before and what MasterCard has said in public before as well, asking private companies to de uh, decide what legal products or services can or cannot be bought and from what store sets a dangerous precedent. Further, it would be an invasion of consumers' privacy for banks and payment networks to know each of your uh, each of our most personal purchasing habits. Visa is firmly against this. They also talked. Uh, they also said, uh, "quote When we process a transaction, we have no visibility into what items consumers purchasing. This is true irrespective of which MCC merchant applies." Um, and uh, and finally, I think most importantly, they say. Quote, our network does not allow any financial institution member to deny transactions for the purchase of legal goods or services based on which MCC they, fought, they fall under. Visa, providers, uh, Visa provides our services to everyone everywhere so long as they are used for legal purchases. 
we believe that is the appropriate standard. And so, I mean, they to be fair to Visa, they do seem to be just shooting down this whole concept that yeah. that Sorkin and Elizabeth Warren and uh, you know people like Letitia James and New York AG have, have brought up for this change. It, my discussions with uh, the processors is they're not happy they've been dragged into this. Um, you know, it's a little unclear what, how, you know, did they really fight the establishment of this this standard, the code? Uh, you know, that remains to be seen. But, you know, but even the quote you read from Visa. So uh, Acme Bank couldn't deny all transactions uh, coming from a gun store under the code. But if they get access to what's in the basket, that statement would not preclude them from saying, well, we'll process other gun store transactions, but not ones where they're buying that. Mm -hmm. So that's so Visa that's says they don't want that. They don't uh, want that, that level right, either. Not, you know, um, they also said they didn't want the code, but here we are. Right. Yeah. And I, I get, the other thing I'll say is these these are pretty strong statements from Visa to their uh, credit. But. You know, we we talked to them. We reached out to them. Uh, I spoke with their very briefly with one of their spokespeople, um, and they just would not answer any questions beyond what was in the blog post. And if their position is that they don't intend to use this MCC code the way that the people who have pushed for the change are advocating, then it, it's still unclear to me why they're adopting it at all. Well, and they're not obligated, right? It's not a legal requirement that they adopt the code. It's a voluntary industry standard. They, right. They, if the three of them decided we're not going down this path, um, but they have all said immediately after it was adopted, within 24 hours, that they would adopt and implement the standard because that's the standard for their industry. Um, so you know, they've sort of been dragged into this by the gun control community. Um, and so now they're trying to figure out, it seems to me, how to navigate it. I mean, they are talking to the Hill. The Hill is asking them pointed questions. And I, I will tell you, we are aware, because uh, we're getting questions from state legislators, from attorneys general, what's going on. They're, they're going to be engaging on the issue as well. So what uh, what is the industry doing to prepare for this MCC implementation, if anything? like What, what can actual... You know, what are you well, telling your retailers? Um, you know, we're uh, working to educate members of the industry. Um, what we're seeing already, you know, um, we've heard this and we've seen some some stories about it. Retailers are putting ATM machines in their store. So you know, and you see comments in social media, et cetera, saying, "Well, we'll just simply pay with cash, right?" So, um, and if you're a bad guy, right, like you're uh, Illegal firearms trafficker. Well, just pay. Then you'll just pay cash and avoid any. You know, so I don't. You know, you, you'll sidestep it. But then it brings up, uh, you know, other unintended consequences. Now you have gun stores with a lot of cash. You be if you got a lot of cash, you become a target uh, for robberies, right? So, hmm. um, so there's. there's well, I would that. also wonder too, because uh, obviously, certainly, I've heard that comment a lot on social media. Well, just buy guns with cash from now on. And uh, like, yeah, that would prevent you from the purchase from showing up in this new MCC yeah. code. But uh, but also that that would seem to be a pretty severe blow to the industry if people feel they can't buy guns with their credit or debit, because this would also affect yep. debit card yeah. purchases. Uh, um, then that, that's going to, I mean, that's bad. It's not a good yeah. thing for the industry, I would imagine. No, I, I mean, we... That, right, we wouldn't want to see that because you know should be treated like every other industry and be able to access and use the payment process. I'd suspect you'll see legislation introduced in Congress um, on this. Maybe, maybe not till the next Congress. I think they're, they'll. Pro I wouldn't be surprised to see hearings uh, on this issue. Um, you know, in the next Congress um, to sort of get to the bottom of what happened and how this why this was adopted. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the sort of very troubling uh, ISO process where, you know, it, they were re-invited after being rejected twice. Why? Who did that? And, you know, how did it get appealed and approved in the same day? That's very 
kind of suspect to me. That that just raises a lot of red flags for me about the, mm. about the process. Uh, so do you we'll uh, do you have any concerns about uh, basically blue states, Florida? Um, sorry, New York and California adopting policies that require you know if somebody spends X amount of dollars at this MCC code. That they'll that transaction yeah. will have to be reported to local law enforcement. Uh, you know that's something that's like that. something like that could happen. And on the opposite side, you know, I could see very red states saying you're not allowed to use that code and process a mm -hmm. transaction in this state. And you know, and if you do, it's a fine. So um, it, this has just become another uh, you know battle on the overall sec Second Amendment fight. It seems so. And I. It seems like it could go broader than that, too. I mean, uh, there's no MCC code for abortion clinics right now. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if that becomes another hot button issue here. Soon. Uh, I, I think you can almost guarantee things like that will occur. It's just sort of the mm. natural, okay, well, you did that to us, we'll do that to you as well. Two can play that game. So, yeah. um, and, and I, we frankly have already heard that from some state legislators saying, well, you drop a bill to require, you know, Reporting for you know, uh, you know, uh, abortion services, you know, some other hot button issue, or you know, name, name the product, right? I mean, yeah. Like, uh, right. You know. Yeah, I guess that's the thing about this MCC code is like, if it if it had happened, if this change had happened without the obvious political uh, intentions behind it, it might not have been as controversial because there are, you know, like there's MCC codes for all sorts of industries, but, right. but because of that, uh, it changes everything about it and brings us, bring this, brings us into like the culture war tit for tat as well yeah. as, and, and it just ultimately, I don't know, does it just doesn't seem like it could be the basic idea stands, you know, holds water of it, how this could even be useful. I don't see how it works, how it could be useful. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, the people advocating for this or gun control advocates, this is not something originating, you know, from the payment processing system saying, hey, we need we can approve our system. Uh, you know, they're not asking for this. In fact, that, you know. They say they were opposed and don't want it. And that, you know, you read the statement for Visa, MasterCard just put out a very similar statement. So is American Express that we just saw just, just today, mm. uh, you know, responding to the letter from Senator Warren and others saying this changes nothing. We don't see inside the basket. We don't want to see inside the basket. Our, our system is available for, so long as the transaction is legal and, you know, buying firearms from a licensed dealer um, is legal and it's not just legal. It's the exercise of a constitutional right. Right. Yeah. That's kind of one of the other ironic things about all this is that it only impacts sales that are done by licensed right. dealers right. because those are the ones accepting credit and debit cards. And so you already have to go through a background check Correct. to accomplish that. Right. Um, and if you buy t more guns than more than one gun in a certain period, then that gets reported to the ATF. Right. There's already a lot of things done in this in this right. front. Um, but and as anyway, said, I wanted to you know the retailer at the counter, right, is in the best position to kind of say, well, yeah. this doesn't feel right. You know, I, I'm not comfortable with this, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through with the sale, which happens every day in this country. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I want to move with the. Uh, the time we got left um, to talk about um, the state of the industry right now, because, uh, you know, obviously we're we just came off two years of the best sales numbers in history. Um, some incredible um, financial reports from the two uh, publicly traded companies, Ruger and Smith and Wesson. Smith and Wesson had the first billion dollar revenue year of any gun company in history. Now we're seeing that those numbers slow down, right? Come back to earth. Um, Smith & Wesson posted a 69% um, drop-off in sales uh, in their for first quarter of this year, which is, uh, you know, their first quarter is, it's a financial quarter, so it ended in July, it's not calendar. But but either way, uh, you know, your, your Ruger had their sales decline in a similar fashion, uh, not quite as steep, but, uh, you know, these companies uh, are seeing uh, slowdowns. You're also seeing this in the next checks numbers, which you guys do an analysis of every month where we're now back towards the third best month right. each month. Right. Um, 
and you're seeing this summer season actually be the slow season again because normally it is in most years but the you know the pandemic the rioting all the stuff that happened politics the election yeah drove so much uh activity what what is your uh you know forecast now what is your outlook on where the industry is is at so obviously as you mentioned 20 and 21 were you know, off the charts, highest sales ever in the history of the industry. Uh, and so at some point that, that was not sustainable forever. So we're seeing a return to, uh, you know, more normal, quote unquote, um, you know, from the peak. But so 22 will be the third best year in the history of the industry. That's very clear from the next data, as you mentioned, every month has been like the third best month ever, you know, behind 20 and 21. So it's going to be the third best year, which is not a bad thing, right? So it's still a phenomenal year for the industry, just not the same as 20 and 21. But again, that, you know, that was not sustainable forever. And, you know, we've seen these uh, spikes in demand in the past, and they usually come either with a presidential election or as a result of some political event or tragedy that leads to uh, you know, heated discussion about gun control and, and banning products. But mm-hmm. what we see, if you look at the next data over many years, you see the spike, and then you see when it comes off of the spike, the, the valley floor is higher uh, before the, the surge. And we're seeing that here, right? We're settling at the third best year, but it's still way ahead of where we were in 18, 19, et cetera. You know, people refer to the Trump slump, right? Right. Uh, You know, and so, uh, but, you know, the Trump slump was still well ahead of, you know, where things were in in the couple of years before that. So so that's a phenomenon we see over time. That will repeat itself, I believe. Um, You know, sales are moderating. Uh, ammunition sales, you're starting to see a product on the shelf a little more regularly, uh, but demand is still very high overall. We have a lot of new gun buyers in the last two years, uh, and many of them are engaging in the shooting sports and hunting, and so they're consuming ammunition, and it's like many uh, kind of sports, you know, you, you, you buy a golf clubs and then you say well i need a better driver i need a different wedge or a putter so then you go buy other products um you know skiing the same thing right well, i need a uh, ski for powder snow i need ro- ice skis rock skis and i need different skis for skiing moguls than you know groom trails that sort of thing so we'll we'll see that it, you know it will moderate now you know we'll see what happens in the midterms i think if both chambers flip, and then obviously the Democrats cannot advance gun control in Congress and put it on uh, President Obama or uh, Biden's desk. Uh, so I think that will cause more moderation. There, you know, as you know, when there's threats to uh, bans, people react and try to purchase uh, what they perceive will be banned before that happens. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, both chambers flip, and it's, I think it's very clear the House will flip. It's a question how uh, much of a majority Republicans will have. The Senate is is more of a toss up, but um, but if it flips, you know, by in, by one seat, right, it's then changes control and, and the and they, you know whoever's in the majority sets the agenda. So it will moderate, and then I think as you approach twenty four, depending on the politics, depending on the rhetoric leading into the twenty four presidential election. Sales are likely to pick up again leading into that election. That's just sort of the cycle we see. But, but no question, we're off of the peaks, but the valley floor is higher. Right. Uh, speaking of uh, these sales spikes in response to uh, you know legislation, effectively moving forward. Uh, obviously, we had the assault weapons ban pass the House for the first time in 30 years uh, since the last one expired. Um, but it doesn't seem like we've uh, experienced a, you know, a big rush in uh, purchases of the affected guns, AR-15s, AK-47s. Uh, yeah, they're what you guys call modern sporting rifles. Um, 
you know, I, I've talked to a couple of retailers in the Northern Virginia area here and just, you know, I go to gun stores on a regular basis and don't, don't notice any empty shelves in terms of, uh, you know, AR-15s. Um, and I've talked to Brandon Wexler of Wex Gunworks down in Florida, who's, uh, you know, experienced the same thing where it hasn't really been a, a big jump in sales. Obviously, that's not, you know, I'm still trying to talk to some more retailers throughout the country just to get a better idea. But, uh, you know, have you have you noticed any uh, increased demand for ARs in the wake of that assault has been? And uh, if not, why why not? We have not. Uh, we you know we haven't heard reports from manufacturers or retailers telling us, wow, there's a, a, a surge has occurred. And I think the reason for that is because it's very clear the bill that just barely passed the House um, is not going anywhere in the Senate. Uh, it doesn't have anywhere near 60 votes it would need to move. Uh, there are many Democrats that would not vote for, for this uh, a ban on modern sporting rifles. I think, uh, I don't even believe it would get 50 votes, let alone anywhere approaching 60. So I think right. there's not a political fear, despite the rhetoric coming from you know, Schumer, Biden, Pelosi, the votes are not there. Uh, I sure. don't even think it has uh, anywhere near 50 votes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably true. Uh, but uh, I guess, uh, do, you, do you think gun buyers have become a bit more savvy on, you know, which legislation is likely to pass and which um, is not? Because obviously yeah, in the past, they, uh, we've seen spikes around legislation that ultimately didn't, yeah, didn't go anywhere. Uh, I think um, maybe that's true. I'm not really sure. Uh, we, you know, we really haven't done any kind of polling to sort of get a, a view on that. But I, I think, uh, you know, we've certainly tried to explain to people the votes aren't there in the Senate. Um, many political stories about it have also made that point that it's very unlikely to move anywhere in, in the Senate. Um, so, uh, and interestingly, in the House, uh, more Democrats voted against it than Republicans voted for it. Only two Republicans voted for it. Those are the two votes necessary to get it over, to, to pass it. But um, mm -hmm. there were, I believe, seven uh, Democrats who voted no, uh, which was interesting. So, um, so I don't think it's moving. M maybe uh, the buyer is, is sort of realizing that uh, from, from the press. Uh, uh, you know, hard to say for sure. The other factor I would say is the Bruin decision. I think has probably had an impact that mm. now for the first time, people say, okay, there's clearly no history to banning rifles of any kind. Uh, and so, and I believe under the, you know, the Supreme Court's articulation of a proper test in Bruin, uh, I think we're gonna see bans that are in place now at the state level fall and be struck down. Um, the same for magazine capacity restrictions. So that decision you know, really is a game changer or uh, the future of gun control legislation. It's going to be That's much more difficult for the, the gun control uh, organizations and advocates to uh, you know, have bans on hardware and things like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It makes you kind of wonder if that sort of uh, uh, legislation-induced demand of people worrying about new bans is going to yeah. Uh, go away, and uh, you know, after after this, maybe people won't yeah. be as concerned about it anymore, and they're not going to rush out to buy. Well, you, you know, know that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like slow and steady mm -hmm. wins the race, right? It's very hard for the industry to respond to these sudden, unpredictable uh, spikes in demand, right? You can't just, mm -hmm. you know, you don't carry a bunch of inventory sitting there that maybe someday in the future, you don't know when there might be demand, you know, the spike in demand, right? So you try to respond, you know, lean manufacturing, you know, manufacturing just in time. So when there is these huge surges, uh, you know, you can't uh, produce the product overnight. It takes a little while to get it in the, in the distribution channels and on the, you know, the retailer's shelf uh, to be purchased. So, and, you know, because of that, um, you know, lack of supply in response to the spike in demand. That, of course, is what causes prices to go up, basic economics. But so, you know, back in like 94, 
when the first ban went in place, there was a surge in demand. A lot of companies jumped in and started making the product. And then when and then when the ban went in place, it all collapsed and a lot of people went out of business as a result of that. So, you know, honestly, slow and steady wins the race. That's you know much more. Uh, you know, that's a better environment for you to plan and operate your business. It's more predictable, things like that. So, um, so I think, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Interesting. All right. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk to us about, uh, you know, what's going on in the industry and talk about some of these issues that we've been covering here at the reload. So, uh, yeah, if uh, people want to learn more about NSSF or, or read more of uh, what you write, uh, because you, you know, obviously you write, you, you also are out there writing op-eds a lot of the time. Where can they go and do that? Just www.nssf.org, National Shooting Sports Foundation.org. Uh, you guys also have a great uh, resource to find ranges too, right? Yes. Uh, uh, where for, to shoot, where to hunt is all yeah. accessible off of the website. So you want to find some place you need. Yeah, you can punch in your zip code and and uh, find a range, or, or if you want to go hunting, you can do the same thing. So we try to have lots of re- lots of firearm safety education information and resources um, on our website. Information for retailers, you know, compliance training, ATF, don't lie, Operation Secure Store, Project Child Safe, obviously, um, mm-hmm. and things like that. So a lot of information on our website, not just for the industry. Yeah, a lot of stuff that I think probably the listeners of this podcast would be interested in checking out. So people should head over there when they get a chance. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll have to have you gone on again in the, in the near future. Here. Yeah. Good to All see right. you. Thanks. All right. It's time for the news update. Uh, we've got contributing writer Jake Fogelman here with me. How are you doing, Jake? I'm doing fine, Steve. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, it's uh, There's a new Blackpink album. So I got the shirt on. Um, <laughs> I like, I like, uh, you know, classic rock and, uh, alt rock and then one K-pop band, <laughs> which is, which is this one. So, uh, you know, fairly eclectic taste, I guess sometimes, but <laughs> it's a good album, so you should listen to it. Uh, but more importantly, <laughs> I've got a new story from you, uh, about, a very well-known person in the gun rights community, Dick Heller. What What is he up to right now? That's right. Uh, Dick Heller is back in the news for more gun-related litigation in the District of Columbia. He just ha- had some success once again getting the district to repeal a gun law that he was challenging in court. Um, this time it's sort of a peculiar law that I don't think a lot of people outside of D.C. are kind of aware of. Um, yeah. But since the mid-'70s, uh, DC has had a restriction on the amount of ammunition people can carry if they're licensed to carry in the district. Um, so this, this isn't a magazine capacity restriction. They have one of those as well, but this specifically refers to the amount of ammunition you can carry on your person when you're out and about. Uh, so their previous rule was it can only be twice the amount of the capacity of the particular gun that you're carrying. So say you have a a six shot revolver that you're carrying. That means you can only have 12 rounds of ammunition on your person and the maximum Mm -hmm. cap is 20 because they have a 10 round magazine limit. So they assume that you can't carry more than 20 rounds of ammunition. Um, Yeah. And and it's unique to every individual person's gun, right? It's uh, one of the real odd things about it because uh, the same person could have uh, two different limits based on whatever gun they happen to be carrying. Right. Um, uh, But yeah, so, so Heller challenged that, right? That's right. Yeah. Very shortly after the Bruin decision, uh, got handed down in June. He he filed a, a suit against DC, and uh, that just two days before they were set to file their reply b- brief to his complaint, basically defending their law uh, against his request for an injunction, they just decided on an emergency basis to outright repeal that law, uh, just to avoid the whole thing. So he was successful once again in getting them to repeal a gun law. Yeah, and for those who don't know who Dick Heller is, um, he was the individual plaintiff in DC versus Heller, which was the first uh, time that the Supreme court established the second amendment protects an individual right to uh, own guns, to at least keep guns inside your home. He, he was challenging at the time DC's total ban on the ownership of handguns, uh, even inside your own house. So uh, he's very important in second amendment litigation for that reason. And he's, 
also pretty unique. Uh, and you, you talked to him, so you got some uh, idea of this. Uh, he's obviously, he's a very passionate, um, he's kind of a gadfly, right? Uh, which is a little different than what you find with a lot of individual plaintiffs in federal gun cases, because usually the way it works is, you know, a gun rights group wants to challenge this law. They think they have a good shot at overturning it. And so they go out and recruit plaintiffs who are affected by it. And these people are, you know, people who want to see the law overturned because it adversely affects them personally. But, uh, and you need stand, you know, you need individual plaintiffs in off, you know, often cases for to have standing so you can actually sue. Uh, usually it can't just be the, uh, the gun rights group on its own. They have to show their people affected by this uh, individually. But in, so in that case, in most cases, they're recruited by these groups. They go out and try to find somebody who, who's willing to sign on to a lawsuit. Uh, in the, there are occasions, and Heller is probably the most well-known occasion of this, and at least in the gun sphere, uh, where you have a plaintiff who initiates a case on their own, who is who's sort of more of an activist uh, litigant. Like they're they're involved from the very beginning. They're the ones who want to bring the suit. Uh, and might even face either opposition. I think Heller faced quite a bit of opposition uh, fr from the gun groups to filing his first case. They, uh, some people didn't think that was going to succeed, um, but he went forward. Uh, Alan Gura was the lawyer who won that case. Um, and, you know, uh, you also have occasions where perhaps a, litig you know, a litigant who's not a plaintiff who's not in an area that's very popular for gun suits. So Hawaii in particular, and, and I'm thinking of uh, uh, George Young, who is the, the plaintiff in, in Young v. Hawaii, obviously. But uh, that case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court and had, was granted, vacated and remanded uh, in the wake of Bruin. But it was uh, the open carry case against Hawaii. And that was filed by Young on a pro se basis initially, um, which means without a lawyer. And uh, he had tried to file against this law a couple of times and was having uh, what, at least what Alan Beck, who ended up being his, his lawyer, felt was he was being treated unfairly by the court system. And so Beck wanted to help him just to be able to make sure he uh, had everything in line to get this case an actual you know, hearing in front of a judge, um, not necessarily expecting it to turn into a major gun rights case. Uh, but, you know, they're, Jung and, and Heller are relatively uncommon <clears throat> types of plaintiffs in, in these cases. And, uh, and Heller especially, because he, not only did he do the first Heller case, which turned into a landmark case, he's done, uh, I don't know, it's seven or eight. I can't, it's hard to keep track at this point because he's just constantly filing these cases and a lot of them he's winning. Uh, and even the ones where he loses, uh, I believe it was Heller two is what it's called. That was the case against DC's assault weapons ban, uh, years ago where, uh, Kavanaugh, who's currently a Supreme court justice was the, he was the dissenting vote in that decision on the DC circuit. And that was an extremely important dissent in the realm of, of gun litigation, because that was the first one to talk about this uh, history and tradition standard, text history tradition. I think they kind of shortened it to text and tradition in Bruin, but that standard was really first uh, articulated in Heller 2. Uh, it might have been Heller 3. Don't hold me to the number. It was Heller 2. Yeah. But yeah, I thought that's good, good. I thought that's what it was. But anyway, uh, even when he loses, Oftentimes, these cases have significant impact on um, gun litigation moving forward. And so, he, and he, as of late, he hasn't been losing, right? This is, there was another recent case that, that you wrote about uh, a little while back uh, that involved Heller too, right? That's right. Yeah. So, so the strategy seems to be for the last couple of Heller suits where he's, he's gone after the district, um, rather than actually wait for a, a court ruling saying, you know, this law is unconstitutional, we're going to put an injunction on the law, blah, blah, blah. It seems the district's new strategy is just to say, 
kind of read the tea leaves, see that they're probably going to lose, and then they just get in front of it and they repeal the law before any judgment can be issued against it. So the case you're referring to, we covered last year, uh, Heller went after their so-called so -called ghost gun ban, which again was another really peculiar law in the way it was written. It was very, very expansive to the, to the point where there was actual law enforcement critics of the law who said, hey, this possibly criminalizes our Glocks because they, they went after the whole polymer. It can't be so, some percentage plastic because they were worried that metal detectors wouldn't be able to detect it. It's kind of the, the classic hysteria that we've seen since the advent of polymer framed striker fired guns. This has come up from time to time. But essentially, that's how broad their law was written in an attempt to go after ghost guns. And the attorney general actually stepped in in that case and said, yeah, we're probably going to lose. So I want the city council to, you know, amend this law just to get in front of a, a judgment. So and that's basically the same thing that happened here in this the, this ammunition ban case where two days before they were expected to submit a brief defending the legality of this law under the new Second Amendment standard. They just said, you know, to heck with it, just on an emergency basis, we're just going to repeal it. And so that's the new the new tact they appear to be taking. Yeah, uh, and it's really not that it's not super new for DC because they've been doing this not just in Heller cases as well, um, but also in uh, a number of major gun litigation uh, events. Where, uh, for instance, Ren v. DC, which is the case where <clears throat> the city's uh, gun carry law was struck down. They actually so they had a total ban on concealed carry that got struck down and and open carry, so all all forms of legal gun carry. That was struck down. Then they passed uh, what was basically the same law as what New York and, and Maryland and California have had, um, <clears throat> which was a May issue law that basically still allowed them to um, subjectively deny permits to people who applied. And so they did that <clears throat> and they denied almost all of them. Right. And so uh, they lost on that law as well. They had their May issue law struck down a couple of years before Bruin was handed down, you know, obviously this year. And so uh, they had the they had the choice to appeal to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> but instead, they decided not to. And the attorney general were seen uh, explicitly said it was the, the decision was made so as not to risk setting a nationwide precedent. And it seems like that's why they're caving on a lot of these things. And, um, you know, that that's a, a totally different strategy than what we've seen from California and New York. In California and New York, in reaction to Bruin, instead of playing it safe or, you know, trying to mitigate cases against them, trying to, you know, give on my, smaller areas of concern so they don't have to litigate these things all the way to the Supreme Court, they're doubling down on these kinds of laws and they're frankly their their strategy seems very likely to produce more bruins uh whereas dc is trying to avoid that is is what it, the tactic seems to be now this case you know it's a really weird law that it probably was has never actually been enforced in any meaningful way i would guess because it's like very hard to imagine a scenario where somebody is uh were arrested over this, but, uh, and so maybe DC just decided it's not worth fighting over at all because it's kind of a dumb law, but, uh, it's, and, you know, with this very random restriction, but, you know, I, I really feel like at this point they should probably just consult with Heller before they, <laughs> before they pass these, these regulations, um, or, or like talk to him about what he plans to challenge next so they can, address it before spending a bunch of money in court uh, to to ultimately lose anyway uh, at the pace that they're going. So um, it's interesting to see Heller just continue this this winning streak without even much uh, resistance from DC right, yeah. anymore. Like they seem they didn't even much more realistic. A defense brief this time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they just seem much more realistic about the the odds of them winning on these uh, novel restrictions that are not historically grounded, right. uh, especially in the wake of Bruin. I mean, that DC was being fairly cautious about fighting these cases up the chain in federal courts from, you know, probably it was, it was like 2018, I believe was Wren. And 
Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a strategy that's kept them from having precedents, uh, you know, created through their cases at the Supreme Court. So it's working in that sense for sure. And I think it's uh, more uh, savvy, I guess, po- litigation strategy than what New York and California are doing, which is just blatantly violate the what's in Bruin. And I don't know. Hope for the best. I was going to say it's savvy on their part, but New York and and California may yet force their hand, depending on how far those cases work their way up. (laughs) Right. So, you know, if it it doesn't really work, if half the gun control movement is taking a cautious approach, trying to minimize the uh, rulings that are potentially going to be handed down against them and create precedents across the country. And the other half is just, uh, doing a Leroy Jenkins like uh, <laughs> strategy of just YOLOing everything. Great and, reference. <laughs> you know, doubling down on all this stuff they said, the Supreme Court in a lot of cases explicitly noted is not constitutional. Right. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how it works out. You know, it's probably the courts aren't uh, lightning quick in their reaction to these things oftentimes. So California and New York haven't had a major loss in court yet. It's only been a couple months since Bruin, and they've only just some of these laws haven't even passed yet. Obviously, we talked about the California right. uh, carry restrictions that didn't get through the first go round that mirror New York's, but we'll probably get through by the end of this year when they start session again. But uh, anyway, we'll we'll keep on top of all that stuff, and we'll most certainly keep on top of what Heller is doing because. It seems to be fairly predictive of how D.C. gun laws are going to turn out because he's been extremely successful. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah. If, if he comes back in court again, I'm sure we'll see another law get struck down on the on the streak that he's on. So uh, stay tuned at the reload. Yep, absolutely. And you can do that by heading over to our website and picking up a membership today. If you want to support the kind of work that we're doing, uh, if you if you like this sober, serious brand of journalism that uh, honestly, it's hard to find anywhere else, uh, informed, but also, um, uh, you know, not a bunch of hot takes, I guess, is the way I would put what we do here, right? Um, uh, we know what we're talking about, and we're not going to try and sensationalize it to, uh, you know, get a bunch of clicks. That's not what we're after. We're after trying to inform people as best we can with um knowledgeable analysis and original reporting, breaking stories that uh, you won't find anywhere else. I think we were the first ones to cover this, this Heller. Uh, I think so too. Yeah. Uh, certainly I, with comment from Heller, but uh, that's often the case that you'll find over at the reload. So um, if you want to s- see that continue, if you want exclusive access to hundreds of pieces that you can't find anywhere else uh, that are member exclusive, uh, you should buy a membership today, support what we're doing. That's how we get, that's how we, continue to do this. We have uh, 100% revenue coming from our members and uh, their subscription. So head over, check it out today. You'll get the podcast day early and you get a chance to be on the show too. We like to do those member segments uh, fairly frequently. So um, head on over there and uh, we'll see you again real soon.